Um, to get started, oh, it got erased. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I'm going to be talking for the first, I don't know, 15 minutes or so. So while I'm talking, you will want to um, go to GitHub and grab a copy of this repo. Um, primarily for the data sets, but you'll also find uh, the note in there as, as well. well. OK, um, so up here, people content, um, this is an overview of what we're going to be doing this morning. Um, R has two widely used um, libraries, two widely used packages uh, for generating visualizations um, called base graphics and then ggplot, which um, is an implementation of an approach to constructing graphics called the grammar graphics. So I'm going to talk a little bit at first about the differences between those two modes. Um, and then I'm going to be focusing primarily on ggplot. So I'm going to explain what base is and um, indicate where you can get some information about how base works. Um, but then the practical part where you're actually using your laptop to generate plots is going to be focused on ggplot. The overall approach um, is we're going to be working through, so there are lots of tutorials online about Here's how to Here's create how a scatter plot on ggplot. And so looking at the folks in the room, I'm guessing a lot of people already know how to do something like create a scatter plot in ggplot. If you don't, that's OK. Um, but we're going to be focusing more on more complex, interesting kinds of plots, often the kinds of things that you might put in a manuscript or maybe a manuscript in progress. So plots that aren't quite finalized, but look much nicer than you would just have with ordinary exploratory plots. Um, so I have four examples here um, using different kinds of data sources to generate different kinds of plots. Um, the last one here is a quick look at visualizing spatial data in R, primarily focused on putting, um, generating a base map and then putting some uh, spatial data on top of that base map. Next week in this workshop series, Michelle Tobias is going to be doing a deeper dive into spatial visualization. But my understanding is when we were laying out the, the series of workshops, Michelle is not going to be focusing on R. She's going to be looking, I guess, for tools like QGIS and ArcGIS. Um, and so I was asked to say a little bit about uh, visualizing spatial data in R. Um, if we don't quite get to this because of time, that's OK. You can grab these notes. And I have two different approaches um, for visualizing spatial data in R. OK, so again, uh, clone or download this workshop if you haven't already. Um, is anyone going to help with that? One or two people. Um, Arthur, would you mind helping her <laughs> grab the GitHub repo? Arthur here. And then I can run Raise your hand if I Yeah. I think GitHub is the only thing that might be like really technically difficult here. Um, this is a kind of base plus intermediate uh, workshop. So I'm assuming that you know how to install ggplot2 if you haven't done so already. Um, that you can load it with the library command and that you can at least know whether or not it has given you an error. Okay, so first a little bit about base graphics. Our kind of a standard set of visualization tools that are typically called base graphics. Um, there's a footnote here about whether or not that's actually the right term for this, uh, but we, like everyone else on the planet, will just refer to them as base graphics. Um, base graphics approach to visualization is often called an artist palette model. So the idea here is that this package provides a set of low-level tools, things like a function for generating points, a function for generating lines, a function for drawing polygons, a little more sophisticated things like drawing a line based on the, drawing a straight line based on its both intercept. Um, or things like drawing a curve based on a uh, function. The idea with this artist palette model is that we start by defining a canvas or a set of axes that we're going to be 
painting on, and then we use these low-level tools to add elements sequentially to that canvas. Um, there are a lot of advantages to the space graphic approach. Um, one of the advantages that's standardly cited when people um, say that they prefer base graphics to ggplot is that it includes a number of one-liners. So, for example, if you just if you have an object in R and you type plot, a lot of the times you get something more or less useful. It might not look really great, um, but you can take data frames, regression models. The results you get from running PR comp or print comp to generate principal components, hierarchical clusterings, iGraph networks, all of these different types of objects in R that you may encounter and use during your analysis, they usually have some kind of plot method, a specialized way of generating a meaningful plot about that object. So this makes it very relatively straightforward to create a visualization relative to the object that you're working with. You don't have to, for example, transform it into a data frame, which is going to be a limitation we'll see with ggplot. There are also one-liners to create more specialized kinds of plots. So histograms, pairs plots, which are really useful in exploratory data analysis, bar plots, box plots, even pie charts. Um, although, of course, You've watched the previous uh, episodes in this workshop, you may wonder, like, why do we have a pie chart option <laughs> in R? <laughs> pie charts are supposed to be really bad for visualization. The point here is that it's a very simple one line call to generate that kind of plot. Because base graphics uses these low level tools, and the idea is that you're creating a canvas and painting using these very low level tools. It's straightforward to extend base graphics to custom classes. So, for example, if you're using some kind of very specialized regression model or some kind of very specialized cluster analysis in R, there's a very good chance that the developers of that package, if they've uh, been responsible, have developed a plot method um, for the specialized objects, like the specialized regression model or data structures. Um, this is because base graphics is very straightforward to extend custom classes. So this is something you can do very easily in developing your own packages. Because base graphics is more or less, it, let me phrase it this way. There are basically no dependencies for a standard installation of R. So if you go to the R website, you download R, you install it, you get the graphics package and you have base graphics already installed. In order to install R without installing graphics, you have to go out of your way and do a kind of non-standard uh, build or installation of R. So you can send someone with a code that generates the visualization with base graphics, and they should be able to generate that same plot. This is nice for reproducibility reasons, among other things. Base graphics is also very flexible for unusual visualizations or combinations of plots. So an example of an unusual visualization would be what's called a triplot or very centric coordinates. This is where you have a uh, three categorical variables, you have a probability distribution between them, and you visualize that by placing points within a triangle. Um, this is very hard to do in a framework like ggplot, but it's more or less straightforward to do um, in base graphics. Base graphics is also very useful when you want to combine plots in interesting ways, especially when you want to put plots on top of other plots, or put plots on the margins of other plots. So an example here would be a scatter plot with marginal density distributions. Um, this is pretty straightforward to do in base graphics. Heat maps are actually very hard to do in ggplot. Um, and heat maps with marginal dendrograms. So you're showing not just the heat map, but also how, how things are clustered. That's what will be straightforward in base graphics. And so, for example, a lot of um, heat map functions. I know, for example, I think it's in Bioconductor. Um, a lot of the heat map functions in Bioconductor will use base graphics to generate heat maps with dendrograms on the margin. 
Um, and finally, so one thing that Duncan was talking about, I think, last week was this idea of having a map. So his example was something like a map of the Bay Area, and then you have inset plots. So you have one uh, showing data in San Francisco, another showing data in Oakland, and another showing data um, you know, in Marin somewhere, for example. This would be relatively straightforward to do in a spot once you understand the basic tools of generating a series of canvases and combining them together into one overall visualization. Base graphics is very good for this kind of thing. The ggplot would be kind of a nightmare <laughs> to do something like that in. So these are the major advantages of base graphics. However, base graphics also has a number of disadvantages. Um, one of the big disadvantages for me personally is that the parameters aren't perspicuous. So for example, the way you set the fill color, so you have a polygon and you want to color the inside of that polygon, you set that using the parameter BG. I think the idea here is that BG is supposed to stand for like background or something like that, but you like have to remember that connection. There are some that I think are even harder to remember. Point shape is PCH, maybe for like point character or something. <laughs> and point size is PEX. And I have no idea where that one comes from. So this means um, you may have to rely on, for example, on cheat sheets until you really get down all of these different parameters. A um, common complaint about base graphics is that they have ugly defaults. So if you generate, if you've ever generated a plot using the plot function in R, you can, like rather than points, you have circles and the axes look unattractive and stuff like that. Um, this of course is subjective. I would say I've never heard of anyone who defends base graphics by saying that they look good, however. Um, a final disadvantage of base graphics um, is a kind of technical point, which is almost, it's like 80% a matter of my personal taste, how I like to code, how I think about programming. Um, but there, it also has some functional implications as well. Base graphics works by generating plots as side effects. So when you generate a plot using base graphics, there is no plot object that lives in R that you can manipulate like other R objects. Instead, with all of those level they're doing is they're going outside of R to a graphic device. This could be a window on your screen, this could be the pane in R Studio, this could be an image file. And those commands are drawing something in that graphics device. I can wait about this for a long time <laughs> why I don't like this approach to thinking about visualization and particularly this kind of software implementation of visualization. Um, I have a link here you heard about, about more, more about, about what it means, means causing a side effect in the computer sciences and why that might be undesirable. Um, so maybe I'll just say that and if you want me to rant, you can ask me to rant later. Okay. Yes. Uh, are these, like, um, yes, so this note file that I'm working through, um, this is in the uh, GitHub repository, or it should be. But it's not downloadable somehow because of the big size. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. Um, okay, you can also, so you can also open the notes.r. That's the source file I use to generate this. And you will see I have you know the markdown link in one of the comments oh. <laughs> there. So you can get it that way, even if for some reason HTML isn't downloading. I just the whole repository and have the whole thing before you Okay. Sorry for the inconvenience about the HTML file. Okay. Um, are there any questions about these graphics? Okay, cool. So let's move on to the second major package for uh, visualization in R, which is ggplot grammar graphics paradigm. 
So the grammar of graphics, strictly speaking, refers to a model for visualization developed by a statistician named Leland Wolfenson. Um, the book where he develops this model is titled The Grammar of Graphics. And so I have a, I think it's a Google Books link. Um, so you can check out that book. The central idea of the grammar of graphics is that graphs are mappings. So we start with data over here. And we're going to assume that our data has a number of variables. So we have variable one, variable two, variable three. We have a number of variables and we have a number of observations. So this is observation one, observation two, observation three, and so on. And for each of these observations, we have values for each of these variables. This should look familiar. This is how we visualize the data frame, right? So we have data organized in something that is the functional equivalent of a data frame. And in ggplot, the implementation of this grammar of graphics in R, ggplot assumes that we give it a data frame. There are ways you can pass in other data types. You can pass in something like an iGraph network, for example, but those require additional packages to extend ggplot. And actually what's happening under the hood is those packages are taking, so your iGraph network, for example, converting it into a data frame and then passing that on to ggplot. Anyway, we have data organized as a collection of observations of a series of variables. Uh, Wilkinson, in his book, makes some, makes some distinctions between a plot, chart, graph, and graphic. I'm not going to bother with those distinctions here. <laughs> so I'm gonna say we have a graph. A graph has a frame or panel or a set of axes. It might have multiple of these. <coughs> In this frame, we have geometric objects that have various properties. So they can have position according to x and y coordinates. They can have color, they can have size. So here's a big blue dot, here's a little blue dot someplace else. Here's a big green square. Well, it's kind of a rectangle, but so besides color, size, position, it can also have shape. If we have lines, we can have a solid line. Or dotted. So we have these geometric objects in the graph that have all of these different properties. The central idea of the grammar of graphics is that we map variables from our data to these various geometric properties, properties of these geometric objects. So for example, we might take variable one and map it to the x-axis, take variable three and map it to the y-axis. And let's say we're going to take variable two here and map it to shape or color or the way we draw the line. Okay. This is the central idea of the grammar of graphics um, is that we take variables from the data, we map them to features of geometric objects in the graph. These mappings are called aesthetics. Aesthetics? 
So a graph we can think of as composed of a series of aesthetics that map different variables from our data organized in this way to different geometric features. And if we want to add a new kind of geometric feature, conceptually, that's just a new kind of aesthetic. This also means there's nothing special about, for example, position compared to shape. So right now, I'm adding variable 2 to shape and variable 3 to the y-axis, but I could switch those around. There's nothing, it doesn't seem like there's, no, there's nothing about this variable that's saying it really has to be the y-axis, and instead it can be the shape or the color. <laughs> this gives the grammar of graphics enormous flexibility while also providing a very high-level model allowing us to think about how we want to represent different aspects of our data visually. And so this allows us to draw on um, the kinds of principles and the empirical research that Duncan talked about in the last few workshops, thinking about what kind, what is the best way to represent our data visually to make the point that we want to make. Okay. Um, I think that's what I wanted to say there. Yes. Okay. Any questions about this abstract explanation of the grammar of graphics? Okay, so when we actually use this in R, there are a couple of different implementations floating around. Um, by far the most popular implementation is this package ggplot. ggplot2, or I will often just copy this ggplot. Um, um, this package is developed by Hadley Wickham, who's now at R Studio and is the major developer behind the Tidyverse tools. Um, so among other things, the ggplot2 package is designed to play nicely with the various Tidyverse tools. There are a number of advantages to ggplot2 um, as an implementation of the grammar of graphics in R. So first, we have this conceptual model, which I really like. I really like this way of thinking about how to visualize data in terms of mapping variables to features of geometric objects. ggplot2 also has um, some kind of more, uh, um, I'm not sure what term I want to use for them. ggplot2 can do fasting, which we're going to see some examples of today. Can also change themes and palettes especially easily. Again, we're going to see those things today. Um, and those are, um, usually highlighted as major advantages of ggplot2 over base graphics. Faceting and themes and palettes are relatively difficult to do in base graphics. Plots in ggplot2 are first class objects. This means that they are regular R objects like any other. This relates to the rant that I will only talk about if you want me to bore you um, with a bunch of uh, boring computer science stuff. Another, Another advantage that people offer for ggplot2 is that it has pretty default. I think, um, I personally don't think so, <laughs> uh, which is why we're actually going to be changing the theme of ggplot a lot. We won't use some of the defaults. Um, however, I think this is fair if we're comparing it to the defaults in base graphics. Um, I think the default ggplot2 plot does look a lot better than the default base graphics plot. And because of this advantage in terms of themes and palettes, it's easier to change those defaults than it is in base graphics. ggplot2 does have notable disadvantages. Um, and these are actually pretty substantial disadvantages depending on exactly what your use case is. So first, one major disadvantage is that ggplot2 only works with data frames, and specifically only data frames in a format that's generally called long format. I have a link to a paper explaining what long format is, but it's basically something like this, right, where we have um, observations, every row is exactly one observation, every observation is on exactly one row. 
every column is exactly one variable, every variable is exactly one column. If we have something where um, we really have, for example, two, we're going to see an example. The first substantive example is actually going to address some of the challenges of working around this a little bit. So maybe I will put that there. But this does mean, for example, that if you have, say, um, the output of a regression model or the output of a cluster analysis, you can't just drop that directly into ggplot. You'll need to use some other packages or some workarounds to get that into a format that ggplot can understand. The other major disadvantage of ggplot2 is that there's a huge gap between basic use and even kind of intermediate use like we're going to see today and developing extensions um, to apply ggplot2, for example, to create new geoms or to, I'm sorry, I haven't even used that term yet. To create new aesthetics, that takes a lot of work to do sophisticated things, like, for example, um, some of the example, like uh, putting on marginal densities. That takes an enormous amount of work, much, much more complicated than just generating basic or even um, somewhat intermediate use of the package itself. This is because ggplot2 kind of depends on um, uh, the grid package to manipulate the graphic device, and the grid package is very complicated. <laughs> okay, um, so even if you kind of master ggplot, you're not going to be able to translate that easily into, well, I have this custom data type that I want to work with. Okay. So that um, is background on the grammar of graphics. Um, any questions about that? Or questions about um, how the grammar of graphics compares to base graphics? So in the different frames are basically on index. Is that I'm scared uh, not as such. No. Um, not a lot of things in R are going to change the order of the row. Um, and you can certainly create index variables very easily, right? You can add row, you can add a column that you call like row number or index or something like that. Um, but data frames don't inherently carry a row order. Other questions? Okay. So enough of me just talking at you. Let's actually do some plots. So first, raise your hand if you have any experience with ggplot whatsoever. OK. OK. Um, so that is, seems to be half, maybe a little more than half. So I'm going to do a quick introduction to ggplot with this initial plot. Um, then, because we want to cater to both people who are totally new to ggplot and people who are more um, experienced with it, the other plots, well, for new people, it's going to feel a little bit like throwing you into the deep end. But it's going to be more like I'm going to walk you slowly into the deep end. So um, this first plot is going to be a basic scatter plot to explain basic what ggplot call looks like. And then we're going to look at some more sophisticated plots and we're going to build them up sequentially piece by piece. Okay, so initially they're going to look really complicated to new folks, but my goal is to walk us through how we construct with more complicated plots. So for this quick intro, um, you'll want to um, install this data source package and let it use a library call. <clears throat> While that's going on, you know. So first, I'm putting the dependencies in the different sections um, so that, for example, if you want to skip a section, for example, if you already know how to make a scatter plot in R, you don't need to bother installing this library. Um, that becomes more significant when we get to the spatial stuff. 
if you don't care about the spatial stuff or it takes a bit of setup to do some of these things because you might need, for example, to create a Google account and give Google your credit card number and you might not want to do that. <laughs> so I put those dependencies further down. Um, you won't be able to knit a whole script into a nice HTML file without satisfying all those dependencies, but you won't need to install stuff you don't need to install just for the purposes of this workshop. Um, in general, Putting your dependencies further down in the script is a bad idea, strongly not recommended, don't do it, except when you're teaching a workshop and you don't want to make people install a bunch of stuff that might take up a bunch of time and that they don't really need to install at the very beginning of the workshop. Okay. So that's the first note. Um, the second note is a quick explanation of this data source package. Um, so this uh, package is basically just a little collection of data sets that are designed to illustrate some aspects of exploratory data analysis. Um, the data source dozen data set, the one we're going to be using, um, I think is particularly fun. We're going to see that these data sets look totally different when they're plotted. 13 different data sets. They look totally different when they're plotted. They're clearly very different things. But they all have the same mean, the, stand, the same standard deviation, the same Pearson correlation coefficient. So if you just do summary statistics of your data, you will have no idea that these things are doing something very different and actually very weird. Okay. Um, so it's a nice little demonstration data set for exploratory data analysis, although we're not really talking about exploratory data analysis today. So I'm going to jump over to R. I'm going to jump over to our studio and scroll down a bit. So let's start with this uh, uh, data source dozen wide data set. Um, I'm using the search command. Um, to look at the structure of that data set. And I'm going to use this uh, give.atpr argument, set that to false, because there's some attributes in here that just like clutter things up. So this data set, um, so remember I said there are 13 different data sets that are bundled together in one data frame so that we can easily plot them together. Um, each column, in this representation of it, uh, each pair of columns is one of the data sets. So we have the away data set, the bullseye, the circle, the dino, the dots, and so on. And we have the x and y coordinates for each of those. So we're going to start by using this, and we're just going to plot the dino data set using its x and y coordinates in ggplot. So this is a very simple scatter plot. I'm going to open up a new R window and pull my notes down so I can code this line. And you can see what it's going to give us. OK. So every graph we generate with ggplot starts with the same command, ggplot. OK. Parentheses. The first argument we give to you is going to be the data set we're going to be working with. Uh, so this is a data source dozen wide. And if you're using R Studio and you have the library loaded, it should bring up the autocomplete for you. So the first argument we give ggplot is always the data frame that we want to plot. The second argument will be the aesthetic. The mappings that we're going to use to go from data to features of geometric objects. We designate the aesthetics using an AES call. So put that in parentheses. The first two arguments put in this AES call are the x and y coordinates. So we'll use the x coordinates for the dyno data set. So that is dyno underscore dino, yeah, underscore x, and then dino underscore y. We can also put color, shape, 
line type, if we're generating lines, but we're not generating lines right now. All of those different geometric features we designate in this AES model. Um, we'll actually do color in a second. Let's just start with a totally plain um, scatter plot. Okay. After we close both the AES call and the UP plot, so we need two close parentheses, we're going to put a plus. And then on the next line, we're going to put geom underscore point parentheses. Okay. In ggplot2, geoms refer to the geometric objects we're going to add to the plot. So in this case, we are going to add points to the plot. We've already told ggplot how, what aesthetics to use for the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate. Okay, so we don't need to tell geom point what those aesthetics are. It will just use, by default, it will use the aesthetic of the ggplot. And that is enough to generate a little scatter plot. Okay. We've given it data. We've told it how to map variables of that data to geometric feature, namely x and y coordinates. And we've told it to do that using points. And you can see um, on your screen or down here, the default fonts, the default font sizes. It uses this gray background. Um, it does a pretty decent job, I think, of figuring out um, what labels to use and where to draw lines. I personally really dislike the gray background, so we're going to get rid of that pretty quickly. Um, but this gives this us, gives us the basics, basics of a scatter plot in ggplot. This is more complicated than just writing and just typing point, data frame, dollar sign, one variable, data frame, dollar sign, the other variable. But this little example is something that we will be able to build on in a straightforward way. Okay, so that was my first example. Now, remember the point of this data set is that we have a bunch of different data sets that all have the same mean, standard deviation, and Pearson correlation. But they look totally different when they're brought together. The version of the data set that we just plotted is not in this format. It's not in this long format. It's a data frame, which is why we could put it into ggplot. But the things we want to put on the x coordinate are all over the place, right? We have a variable here x-coordinate, the variable here is the x-coordinate, the variable here, and so on. So this is not the format that a ggplot will recognize easily um, for creating a scatter plot with all of these different data sets. So we need to use a data set with a different format in a different arrangement. So we're going to use um, the data source dozen data frame instead. And so the str data source dozen, and I'm going to do attr, or is it no attr? No, what is it? Give attr, give dot attr equals false. Because again, there's some attributes that just clutter things up in here. Now you can see that this data frame has a much simpler structure, right? It's not wide, instead it's been arranged to be long. We have x and y coordinates, and now we're treating data set as a variable. Not as a way of organizing the different columns, Instead, we just have one column for the x variable, the x coordinate, one column for the y variable, that'll be the y coordinate. And then we have a third variable that represents the data set within this data source dozen. So when we plot this, we can use 
this data set to add additional structure to our plot. And in particular, we're going to use it to add facets, which will create little subplots for each of these different data sets. We're going to start off very similarly to the scatter plot we just created. So, oh, G plot, G plot, open parentheses. parentheses. First thing is always our data set, which in this case is the data source dozen, not Y, just data source dozen. Second thing is the aesthetic with the AES command. So, AES open parentheses, and here the variables are just X and Y. And let's actually throw in color now, too. So we have an example of that before we dive in. So after Y, I'm going to put a parenthesis and a space. And then I'm going to type color equals data set. So this is, I'm going to add an aesthetic here that is going to map the data set variable to this color feature of the geometric objects I'm going to add. Close parentheses plus geom point, open close parentheses. If you run this so far, or either get an error, or you'll get a giant mess, which is not helpful. So we're going to add facets. We're going to split this up into a bunch of little separate plots for each of the different 13 data sets. We're going to use that by adding facet underscore wrap. And then inside that call, inside the parentheses, we'll put a tilde data set. And it's hard to see just down in the corner here. So I um, encourage you to click the zoom button to get a better look at these 13 different data sets. Same mean, same standard deviation, same Pearson correlation coefficient. Okay, so this facet graph, what it's doing? Yeah, so facet graph, facets are these are little panels. Okay. Um, Wrap is a particular way of generating these little panels where we just sort of, we take this variable, data set. Mm -hmm. For each value of the data set, we're going to create a separate panel. And we basically do it in alphabetical order. So one value of data set is away. So we generate a panel for the away variable, and then a panel for the bullseye variable, and so on. Um, there's another function, facet grid where you can actually say, okay, I want to lay out this grid of little panels or facets. I want to use one variable for the x-axis. I'm, I'm sorry, I want to use one variable for the columns of that grid and another variable for the rows of that grid. Um, I didn't have time to come up with a good example for a good example data set to illustrate that. So we're going to be using facet wrap rather than facet grid. To get help in R, remember you type a question mark, then facet underscore grid. That will bring up the documentation. And one of the nice things about ggplot2 is that it's really well documented. You have to learn the idioms like what's an aesthetic and so on. But once you get a sense of that, um, that's really, really documented. And then um, they also have lots of examples of how to set various options and things um, in the example section. Okay. Other questions on these? Yes. Yeah. So you started earlier explaining the, the basics of the graphics, I guess, mm -hmm. basically adding new characteristics of every part of the graph, right? Like, how Conceptually, yeah. Yes. And then here it seems like it's starting to make sense because being a point is an aspect of how something's represented. 
That's probably the right way to think about it. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, I don't have a really great conceptual answer. Like, how do you conceptually distinguish the object from the properties that it can have, um, the kind of object that it is from the kinds of properties that it can have? In some sense, you can say what kind of properties it has depends on what kind of object it is, right? So, for example, a point is zero dimensional, kind of formally, so you can't fill it with a color. Instead, you have to give it <laughs> a color. It's not a polygon that can have a color inside that's different from the color outside. Um, or, like, it doesn't make sense to talk about whether a point is dotted or dashed, whereas it does make sense with a line, for example. So if it says we have geon underscore point, then it'll be geon underscore line, and I'll have a different set of arguments for like. Um, it will look, it will understand different aesthetics. So here I brought up the help for geon points. And if you scroll down, this is another respect in which ggplot2 is really well documented. All of the geons, We'll have this section called aesthetic that talks about what kind of aesthetics it understands. And we'll also have highlighted in bold. Um, you probably can see up on the screen, but if you bring this up on your if you bring the help up on your own system, you should be able to see here the X and Y aesthetics, that is the X and Y coordinates. These are in bold. That means they're mandatory. It doesn't make sense to have a point in two-dimensional space that doesn't have an X and Y coordinate. Points also understand alpha is transparency. Color, uh, so Hadley Wickham is from New Zealand, so he makes uh, UK spelling the default, <laughs> but you can also use American spelling. Um, so points understand color. Some point shapes are actually, like they're not zero dimensional, they can understand fill. And have a point that has like one color inside and then has like a border with a separate color around it. That's what fill is for. Group. Um, group is a little bit more abstract because group is about how different kinds of geometric objects hang together. Um, that's most important when you need to think about how you're drawing line. So you need to tell G plot, I want to draw a line that connects these three points, and then these three points should be a separate line. That you designate with this grouping aesthetic. I'm not quite sure why it's here for point. Um, shape is the shape of the point, circle, square, triangle, and so on. Size is how big it is. Um, I actually don't know what stroke is off the top of my head. Um, stroke actually might be, so there are some point shapes, again, that have like an interior and a border. Stroke might be like how thick that border is, or something like that. Good. Other questions? So, um, yeah. I think this, so if we had one benefit, most of us probably would have only one benefit with a lot of variables. Um, and I think it would be helpful maybe to plot the variables. Like separate like differently, but mm -hmm. different variables so we can do like that kind of graph and so there are these variables like different. Um, yes, and no. <laughs> so it depends on how all of those different variables are represented in the data frame. Okay, so. Remember, oh, I can just scroll back up. Okay. So, data sort of cousin Y has 26 different variables. So, I mean, depending on your field, that's probably a lot, right? So, let's say this data frame has a lot of variables. You can do things like, okay, so this variable, I'm going to map to x coordinate and y coordinate and then color and shape and so on. 
But then there are all of these other variables running around. We're going to see an example of how you can say, okay, here we're going to use this variable, say for the y coordinate, and then elsewhere in the same graph, we're going to use this other variable for the y coordinate. So you can do something like that, but there isn't a nice way to generate the kind of faceted plot like this when the data set is in this format. Because there isn't a good way to tell ggplot, okay, use these 13 variables as the x coordinates and use these other 13 variables as the y coordinates and match them up this way <laughs> into these different facets. That's why we had to move to this representation to do the facets. Because now, with this representation, we have one variable that represents f in all of the different facets, one variable that represents y in all of the different facets, and then a third variable that says, this is how we split up the data into different facets. So if you have a representation like this, you can do something like that. Um, but you can't really do it with a representation like this. this is, so this um, is an example of a wide data set, which is why the data source doesn't wide. This is an example of a long format data set. Um, there are functions, so remember I said ggplot2 is now part of this tidyverse, which is this big collection of packages. There are other packages in the tidyverse that are designed to help you put your data in long format and to switch between long and wide. Um, but we're not going to cover those today. <laughs> if you want, I'm happy to show you how to do that on other times. Um, but we're not going to talk about that today, unfortunately. That's a good question. Other, Other question about a simple scatter plot plus fast. Okay. So now we're going to move on to something more complicated a dumbbell plot. Um, actually, I'm going to. Should be this one? Yes. Okay. No. There we go. Okay. This is the full size version. Um, if you're not trying to see this on the full screen. Um, so this is almost exactly a plot that I used in one of my recent papers. Um, I have a link to the paper if you want to see the original um, in the notes. Um, in this project, so a lot of the research that I do looks at the way scientific communities operate. And so I do a lot of research where I have a collection of journal articles. Um, and in this case, I was looking at um, journal articles in one year, I went to 2014, by using data of the way people. So I had a big collection of metadata on journal articles from one year from UC Davis. And um, I was considering how different fields were represented in that data set. Because for various reasons, I wanted to try to be relatively balanced across different fields. Um, so the y-axis on here are different subject areas. So these are indicators, indicators of the research area that the journal article was published in. So for example, many of medicine um, have uh, sort of cellular biology, agriculture, engineering, physics. Um, down here, so arts, liberal arts, uh, humanities. I thought there was a humanities one in here. Maybe it's arts. Um, social science, there's psychology, there's general social science, um, there's economics, and so on. Okay, so with that context, what is the message that I'm communicating 
using this plot. So you have kind of all represented on the first three, pretty much all the sum. You have more samples than all where? In almost all other. Except for three. Okay. Yeah, so I have a the full data set with all of these journal articles indicated in the red. And when I move to a sampling strategy on this data set, I have a higher percentage of papers from most fields, except for some up at the top. What's happening, what's different with the ones up at the top? Yeah, exactly. So what I was concerned about here in this project was I just got sort of everything published by UC Davis affiliated people in 2014. There's a lot of medical and biology research here. And I was concerned that, that would distort the text analysis I was going to go on, and I was going to lose the signal from social science, humanities, and other fields down here. So I, a sampling strategy where I initially kind of boosted the representation of these other fields, and I was a little bit successful, but I was more successful at sort of bringing down the representation of those biology to produce something more like the balanced data set. Okay. Does anyone know what this what this kind of visualization is called? It's in the section title in the notes, but if you didn't know this, a dumbbell plot. Yeah. So this is called a dumbbell plot because we have two points that are connected with a line segment um, for each of these different categories. Um, if you can draw a dumbbell plot, you can also draw uh, something called a lollipop plot, um, which is sort of a better version of a bar chart, right? So in the lollipop plot, we would have just one circle and a line that would run down here to um, the y axis. Okay. So this is a fairly complicated plot that we are going to create. In G plot. And if you scroll down a bit, you see there's a lot of stuff going on in here. We have a lot of commands that we're going to put together and create this plot. But we're going to start very simply. Um, first, we need to start by loading the data, though. Let me scroll back up. Um, so, assuming, wait. Oh, I'm looking over here in this panel. Okay, um, this next command is gonna assume that you have this data directory variable in your memory. Um, if you didn't run it further up the top of the script, it's just a string data slash. So we're gonna load uh, data frame that we're going to call counts underscore df. We're using the RDS command. So RDS is a sort of binary storage form, uh, format for R. So this is a way of taking an R object and storing it on a disk. You need R to load it again, but it takes up less space than, for example, a CSV. Um, RDS, open parentheses, paste zero, open parentheses, paste zero, it's zero space between the strings we're gonna to put together, data underscore dear comma, open quotes, paper underscore counts dot RDS, close quote, close parentheses, close parentheses, you can also just run this line in the notes. Okay. 
then we'll take a look at this data frame counts df. If you are having trouble getting the data to load, you kind of an error, maybe you raise your hand. Mm -hmm. What? Yes. Oh. Yeah. So if you didn't assign, if you didn't run the line further up in the script where we assign data to DIR, you can do it real quick in your console. So that's data underscore DIR equals or arrow open quote data slash. So counts.df is a data frame. Um, it has three variables. We have the subject area. Remember, that's going to end up on your y axis. There, so medicine, biology, agriculture, English. Um, I've represented it as a factor in this particular order um, in order to get things to plot in the right order. If I just had a character vector here, ggplot would be able to understand that, but it would put it in what would put us in reverse alphabetical order on the graph. Um, outside of ggplot, I've arranged this in order by sample, the descending value of sample, and I've set the data frames to the bad of the order of the factor variable. That is the in some sense, the simplest way to get ggplot to plot a text variable in the order that you want is to arrange things outside and then turn that variable into a factor with the order that you want to plot it in. I'm not going to show that here because it involves a little bit of wrangling and stuff like that. We have the subject area, and then I have two different variables representing the value in the sample data set and the value in the whole. Data set. So, so to, to go, go back, back to this question, I could represent this as I have a data set variable and then a value column where I have the value corresponding to that data set. I chose not to do it this way in order to get the line segments to work. We're going to see we have to give R two different aesthetics to tell it how to construct the line segments correctly. But if you didn't care about the line segment, you could just have a simpler format to the data set. Let's see, I will actually just, no. Okay, Are we good? We're okay, no. We're getting errors loading the data set. Is that the problem? Mm -hmm. A few people. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I need to. But, uh, I'm okay. So I'm in data. Um, down here. Down here. Um, type git wd. Yeah, git wd. Open close parentheses. Yeah. And hit return. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's why. Yours should be on here. Okay. So it seems like some people are having issues with the working directory. If you need to change the working directory, so simplest way to do this in our studio, put uh, bring up the notes file down here in the file pane. More, um, no, I'm sorry, 
this is the simplest way. So bring up the notes folder, bring up the notes file. In session, up at the top, up, set work directory to source file location. Okay. So if you're having, if you're getting errors about like you can't find the data file, try changing the working directory in that way. Real quick. Okay. Other people having problems? Yeah. Okay, it seems like mostly we're ready to go. So I'm going to jump back here. Okay. Okay, so we have, um, I'm going to assume that you have the data set ready to go. And we're going to start very simply with just plotting the full value. And then we're going to worry about other elements as we go. Okay, so we're going to start with the ggplot call. Remember, the first argument is always the data frame. Count, count df, comma, space. Second, Second argument is the aesthetic. And we're just going to give it an x value for now. Subject area. Close those plus on the next line, geom point. So here we're going to give, this is going to draw those red points for the whole data set. So we're going to give it some additional aesthetic here. So we're going to put another AES call inside the point. And first we're going to give it a Y value. We've already given um, our point an X value, subject area. We also need to give it a Y value. Full. And we'll just do that for the moment. So when you get this up, you should get a plot that looks vaguely like parts of the big fancy plot we just saw. We have a lot of other things that we need to add, and then we're also going to do things like we're going to change the theme, we're going to flip the coordinates around, we're going to change the labels. So remember, we had a, a, a more meaningful label for subject area and a much more meaningful label than full here. So there are a lot of things we're going to add, but we have a plot already. Let's Work with this for just a second. Uh, let's, let's go ahead, ahead and add um, the sample value next. So we'll add another genome point. And this time, we also need to give it a Y value. So each geom is going to get the aesthetics from the ggplot call, but it's not going to get the aesthetics from previous geons. Okay, so when we set aesthetics here in a GD, in the geon point call, those are local aesthetics. This geon point won't know about them. It'll still know about subject area, but we're going to give it its own y value. So now we get pairs of points, but we can't tell which is which. So we need to say what color they should be. This is where if we had the long format data set, where we had a data set column, we could say use set color to be the column variable. We could add a color aesthetic very simply. We can't do that because of the way the data set is arranged. So instead, still inside the aesthetics, 
we're going to set color to be the string value. What ggplot is going to do under the hood is it's going to take this value, this character value, and it's going to say, okay, I'm going to create a new variable and everything that gets plotted in here, it's going to have this variable, it's going to have this value full for the new variable. I'm going to create a new color variable and it's going to have this value full. And then when we get to the second jump call, it's going to take that's the color variable, and then it's going to add sample values. So uh, it's cut off up here. You can see on the right hand side of the plot when you get it up, we've added a new variable, and then the legend says color. So it's, you added a new variable called color, and we have different values for the full and the sample data sets. So these colors just like randomly picked by R? They're not randomly picked. They're the default colors that GPFly uses. Yeah. Um, this is actually one of the ways in which I think GPFly has terrible <laughs> defaults for its colors uh, for a couple of reasons. The first reason is if you have more than two values, it's not how we want to anymore. Um, and even like, uh, I have a friend who's red green, red, green, colorblind. He has trouble telling apart these two defaults, right? Because it's kind of, it's red, but it's not a very pure red. And then it's kind of a blue green. <laughs> and those are close enough that he has trouble telling them apart. Um, an additional problem with the defaults is there's not a lot of contrast in brightness between these defaults. And there's relatively little contrast to the gray background. So you might remember from the previous workshop, contrast is really, really important to the way our visual system distinguishes objects. So if we have relatively little contrast, it becomes very difficult for us to distinguish the different points from each other and against a gray background, especially when we have a lot of things going on in the plot. So let's actually go ahead and change the color right now. We're going to do that using the color brewer package. So a plus at the end of the line after the second geon point. And we're going to change a scale. So a scale is the way that an aesthetic, in this case, the color aesthetic, maps values to features of the graph. So we're still going to map these variables to, we're still going to map color in a particular way, um, but we're going to change the values that are used there. Um, so this will be scale color brewer. And inside that, type palette equals set one. Um, so the color brewer palettes, you might remember from previous workshops, are specifically developed. Some of them are designed to accommodate color blindness. Set one, kind of, not so much. Um, set one I particularly like because it uses nice primary red and blue for its first two values. And so I find it to be a little easier to distinguish the, the red. Um, I find it a little, okay. My friend who is red blue colorblind finds it easier to distinguish these. And if you look at like colorblind simulations, you can see that red and blue are easier to distinguish. Um, they also have a much higher, uh, much lower luminance than the gray background. They appear to be darker colors, so they're easier even for someone like me to visually distinguish them. Okay. So we changed the color. What else do we want to do? Um, it's really hard to read all these layers, 
right? They're overlapping all over the place. That's why I flip the coordinates around. So let's change the coordinates. So after scale color more, put another plus, chord underscore flip. Open close parentheses. So this is where the order matters, right? Um, if you remember the order in the data frame, I had medicine at the top, and then this bio CE, and then AGRI, and so on. I set that externally using a factor based on this value of a sample in order to get things in a nice order. To see the effect of just passing in a character, so up here when you pass in subject area, put that inside an as dot character. So this is going to convert the subject area back into a character, and it's going to pass that result as the variable into the aesthetic. Okay. And you see, R has worked us in reverse alphabetical order because it's done this in reverse alphabetical order. It's much harder to read and see any trend. This also shows, by the way, that you can do some manipulations of variables inside of the plot. And it's not really recommended because that can make it harder to understand how your data has been translated, but that can be useful. Okay, that definitely is probably worse. So let's get rid of that as character. Put this version. Everyone still with me? Questions, problems? We're good. Yes. Because it only takes one by default of the value default. And you're saying aesthetic subject area and nothing else is saying X everywhere is going to be defined as yes. subject area. Yep. And that's why you have to declare Y below. And basically, yes. I'm asking, why is it necessary to go to declaring both of X and Y? Why is it necessary to just not work in any of it as opposed to just saying subject area is Y? Um, good. Part of the answer is going to be when we add the line segments. Um, because we're going to see when we get to the line segments that it understands we're going to, it's, it's basically drawing um, vertical lines. Yeah. And so we're flipping this with coordinate flip. Um, so just to make sure the question is clear, the idea was. Well, instead of x being the subject area and two different y values, we could do something like this. Um, I'm just going to do this quickly instead of reading it out. So let's put, um, let's just make map subject area directly y. And then uh, map full and sample directly to X. Okay. And that gets us to the same endpoint, right? Um, this is totally fine. Um, one of the reasons, so the first answer I gave, why did I do it this way? mapping subject area to the x and then flipping the coordinates. Um, the first reason was because when we add the line segments, it works nicer if we do it this way. The other reason is I'm thinking about a graph as between a function, right? A function where this value representation in the data set depends on subject area. 
So from that perspective, it makes more sense to say, my function is data set as a function of subject area. And then I'm going to put this representation to get the, uh, the labels to look nicer. Versus um, this is not the way we normally think about functions. We don't think about the subject area as a function of its representation in the data set. So this goes back to, the second answer goes back to thinking in terms of the grammar of graphics, thinking in terms of how am I taking relationships in my data and representing them, now not so much visually, because visually they're equivalent, but conceptually in terms of the code that I'm writing. Um, this gets to be even more important when you're thinking about things like um, including model predictions, for example, which is what we might get to if we have time. <laughs> yes? Once you uh, finish the code, any layer that uh, you add later on, you actually you, you specify X, X in uh, Good question. Um, so the question was, when we put the coordinates here, is x, does x still mean x and does y still mean y? In some of the, yes. What coordinate put is doing is, remember we applied the scale to the color. We're still mapping the same variable to color, but we're changing exactly how that mapping works. Coordinate flip is doing something like that with position, um, where it's saying, okay, we're still mapping this variable to the x-axis, but I'm just gonna draw the x-axis like this instead. So in the stuff we've seen so far, x and y, um, stay the same, right? We didn't need to change this to X when we use chord flip. There are some things that can make a difference, like your, so um, there are different versions of this chord function. So for example, there's chord Cartesian, um, chord polar, which we might see if we have time. Um, and in this chord function, you can do things like set X and Y limits. So set the boundaries, change the boundaries of your plot. And I think those will be sensitive to what is actually getting represented as X and what is actually getting represented as Y. Um, if you're doing things with the theme, like changing the font, for example, then that can change depending on what is actually plotted horizontally versus what is plotted vertically. But the stuff we've seen so far, it doesn't matter. Good question. Okay. Um, so I'm going to get rid of this. Well, maybe I'll stick it around in case uh, we want to play around with Geon statement. Well, let's add the line statements now. So when I build my plots in ggplot, I like to put all of the geons together and then put like changing the scale and changing the coordinates and when we get to changing the theme, I like to put that further down so I can sort of see here's how things are being mapped together. Um, so in the middle, I'm going to put geom underscore segment. And I'm going to bring up the help so that I remember exactly what aesthetics I need to give this. So geon segment does line segment. Um, you can see there's also a variation on it designed to um, plot curves. But I don't remember exactly how that works. Just highlight that for you all. So geon segment, we need X and Y, and also we need two additional aesthetic for X end and Y end. So these will be the X end point and the Y end point. So the, the line segment, I actually misspoke, not just vertical slash horizontal lines. It can do X coordinate, Y coordinate. Um, 
but then we would have to change around exactly which aesthetics are being passed. Okay. In genome segment, in our aesthetics, we're going to, in the X value, we're going to start and end in subject area. So x equals subject underscore area. I don't need to type this again. I'm just going to do it for the sake of the example. xn also equals subject underscore area. So we're drawing, if we ignore chord flip, we're drawing a vertical line that stays within the subject area. We're going to do this from the value at full and to the value at sample. Close the parentheses, put in a plus. Okay. Now we have the bars of our dumbbells. Uh, we have the bars of our dumbbells. That's what we've added with Gion segment. The fact that Gion segment means a Y and a Y and aesthetic. It has two different aesthetics, two different ways of mapping variables to geometric features. This is why we had to have full and sample as two different variables. We couldn't use a single data set column with this one because we needed to be able to say this is one observation. It has the full value and the sample value, and we're going to connect them. That's why we had to represent things using that wide format as opposed to the long format with the data set column. Okay, so here's the dumbbell plot. Um, it is, is it 11 already? It is 11 already, okay. So I think, um, if you bring up the notes, you can see I have this arrow command that draws arrows to show we're going from full to sample. I think that's relatively straightforward. It's pretty easy to play around with. And it's sort of an extra on top of a basic dumbbell plot. For the sake of time, I'm going to let that go. Um, so that we talk about this stuff down here. Um, we're going to, let's see. What's really important here, um, what happened to the theme? Okay. okay. Oh, oh, here it is. Okay. Um, so we're going to do some labels and we're going to change the theme and then we'll move on. Sound good? Okay. Um, let's do the theme first. So this is something I like to do at the very end, even after the record. Um, actually, let me go back to the plot. The theme of the plot controls things like the background, the fonts, the sizes of the characters, the stuff on the axes, all of those kinds of things. I really don't like the gray background um, for reasons I explained. I think it makes the colors hard to see. And I like a pretty minimal plot. A lot of journals also like that. Um, so we're gonna use theme minimal here. And see, this gets, rid, get, this gets rid of the background. We still have lines indicating to help us read sort of numbers and values and things like that. Um, but we changed the theme. Um, if you bring up the help for theme minimal, whoops, oh, you can see there are a bunch of themes and there are a bunch of options that we can pass in, change things like the font size, the font family that's used, 
um, sort of various sizes of various things. This can be helpful when you're um, developing plots for publication, and for example, you need to set a certain font size um, for publication or presentation, right? Maybe you need a much larger font size for presentation and a smaller font size for your journal article and so on. Um, and there are a variety of different themes. So theme gray is the default. This puts the gray square on the background. Um, theme light and theme dark um, also change things like the, the colors of the overall background. Um, you can see there are a bunch of these and a lot of GGPlot extensions also include additional themes. Um, so play around with the themes to customize the look of your plot. And oh, let's go back to the help real quick. You can also use, oh, it's cut off. You can also use a uh, theme command. So theme memo sets the overall theme for the entire thing. And then you can use a theme command to do things like change the font or change the way, for example, accent labels are displayed in particular. OK, so that's a bit on themes. And then. Oh, yeah, so I have an example here of using a theme to move a legend around. So after theme minimal, I'm going to put theme, open parentheses, legend.position equals a vector with elements 0.8 and 0.2. We'll just do that for the moment. So remember the color legend was outside of the plot boundaries before. This legend position, when we give it these x and y coordinates, that moves it into the plot area. So for example, if you want to show a legend for color, but you don't want it to be outside because you're concerned about room. And like in this case, you have this big blank area with lots of space for a legend, you can move it inside the plot. Theme and bring up the help. There are tons of things you can customize in the way your plot looks. Okay, um, and then we want to do some labels. Okay, so uh, let's just do a couple quick examples. So on my plot, um, I don't want this to say full. I want that to say um, something like share of the data set. I can do that. If all I want to do is change the label, I can use xlab and ylab to change the labels on my axes. In this case, I ignore the chord flip. This is the y. Share of data set. I can set the Y label to this string, share of the data set. And with chord flip, that'll be on the X axis, I think. Yep. Okay. In the notes, you can see some more sophisticated examples. So I changed the name of uh, this, of the color scale from. Um, right now it's just color. I change the data set within the scale color brewer function. Um, I also, I use um, scale y continuous rather than y label in the notes. And there, I not only change the name of the data set, I also add some formatting. So this shows up as percentages rather than just numerical values. I think the last thing I want to show here is how to add a title, and in particular, how to add a timestamp. So this is something Duncan mentioned, I think, in the first week. Putting timestamps on your plots lets you keep track of um, when you actually generated this particular visualization. So you know, oh, I updated my data set. I need to recreate this plot. So to add a title, the command is ggtitle, open parentheses. 
And what was the title? The title was something like um, Sampling and Cruise Balance Between Subject Areas. Close quotes, close parentheses, put a pop at the end. You see that gives us a title across the top pretty nicely. In the notes, we look at um, adding timestamps in a couple of different ways. You can use the annotate function, which lets you put objects onto the plot, arbitrary objects. And I show how you can use that to add a timestamp. I put it underneath the legend in the example. Um, that annotate function is also popular for things like um, putting on um, regression equations or regression coefficients. For example, adding those like the very top of your plot. Um, but annotation is kind of weird. It interacts with fascinating in a way that's often undesirable. So probably a better place to put a timestamp in ggplot is in the title. So we can do that using the subtitle. I thought it was subtitle, using a subtitle argument. So inside the title call, put a comma after our title string, then put subtitle equals sys with a capital S dot time, open close parentheses. This puts a timestamp as the subtitle. Mm -hmm. Which I honestly had not thought of to do that before Duncan recommended it two weeks ago. Okay, we don't have all of the elements. Um, but I do want to make sure we at least get to um, hide and scatter plots, which is the second example. Um, I think will be especially useful not just for like producing plots, but also uh, for some exploratory data analysis, which was kind of one of the other topics today. Um, so are people good to move on? Are there any remaining questions or things from the original plot that you really want to see? Quick. Yes. Yes. No. You don't put the the, the arrows from the X, like from the Y, I guess. But you don't you don't specify the, where you get the data. So you will. So yeah. So arrow shows up within geom segment. Mm -hmm. um, if you bring up the help for that, you can see there's an arrow argument. Or if you look in the notes, where is it? Um, it looks a little weird. Let me bring up this version. There it is. Okay. So, arrow is um, fed into the geom segment here. So, it's an arrow that gets attached to the line segment. And we use this arrow command. And it has a bunch of options that we set. Um, to specify, so the angle specifies like the angle of the arrowhead, if I remember right. Um, close, I forget exactly what that does. It might be the type of arrowhead. Mm -hmm. um, the length, I think this is to slightly pull it away from the points so it doesn't overlap with the points. So, so the, my question is uh, yeah. the D4 is always from the first Q. To x, y, to the oh yes, XN. yeah, from the x, y values to the x, n, y, n values. Yeah, good. Okay. Other burning questions about this plot? Okay. So let's so let's move on now. Um, I had some discussion questions. Maybe we'll come back to those. Okay. So for the second plot, we're going to create, it doesn't look like it, but this is a scatter plot where we have tens of thousands, I think it's like 14,000 data points that highly overlap with each other. So this is a scatter plot representation when we have highly overlapping data. 
Um, we're going to load another data set for this. Let's come back here. So in the console, I'm going to call this, um, I think I used temp. Yeah. Temp underscore df. So this is temp as in temperature. And we're going to load it using the same RDS function. And hopefully we have taken care of the working directory issues. So this works pretty much the same. This file is called temp.rds. And this is not temp in the sense of temporary, but temp in the sense of temperature. We're good on loading the data this time. OK. So this data frame, um, this is a collection of um, weather data, climate data from NOAA. Um, I have another script, I think it's climate.r, that shows how I download this data and arrange it into this format. Um, four different weather stations, one in Davis, one in Sacramento, one at Lake Berryessa, and one in South Lake Tahoe. Um, going from, I think it's 10 years, 2009, to beginning of this year or the end of last year. Um, we have date stamps that I've broken out into uh, year, month, and day, in case that's convenient. Um, we also have positions, latitude and longitude. And then the actual data that we gather, minimum temperature, maximum temperature. I went ahead and did that precipitation, although it didn't make visualizations as nice, so you can use it. And then um, what I was really interested in here, I'm not a climate scientist, by the way, so. This is not going to be a sophisticated analysis, and if you are a climate scientist, you probably tell me I'm doing things wrong, but that's okay. This is really just to demonstrate plots. But sort of the motivating question here for me was how much temperature changes dirt between the minimum and the maximum, um, and how that might be different in these different locations, and how it might differ over the course of the year. So this temp delta is the difference between the maximum and the minimum. We have, yeah, just under 15,000 observations here. Um, so let's start by making a faceted scatter plot to try to visualize these data. So we're going to start with the plot. Our very first thing is our data frame. And what I want to look at, I want to look at how the maximum temperature is related to this temp delta, the change in temperature. This warning message about missing values, um, this is because you know, there are 104 instances where we actually don't have temperature data. That's not a big deal. Um, when ggplot, ggplot will still generate a plot for us. When there's missing data, it just doesn't plot those at all. Okay, so. Great, great big messy scatter plot, right? right. Lots, Lots of overplotting because we have about 15,000 observations. So we want to break this out a little bit and try to get a better understanding of the structure of this data to get a better potential understanding of this relationship between temperature difference and maximum temperature. Well, the first thing we can do, remember, we have four different sites. We have Davis, Sacramento, Lake Berryessa, and stuff like Tahoe. So we can facet these. And that variable is name for the site. That's maybe a little more helpful. We just have massive overplotting. Right, we have points all over each other, 
And in particular, like for Lake Tahoe, for example, it's really hard to tell, like, do we have a lot of points down here where we have a, it seems like a pretty strong relationship, or maybe we have a lot of points kind of up here in this bulge where the relationship might be relatively weak. So we need um, something better than G on point to show how things work together. And so we have a bunch of different options that we're going to work through. So I'm going to comment out G on point. I'm not going to plot all of these individual points because that's, there's just too much there. An alternative genome is called genome count. When you plot this, you'll see a pretty similar blobby matter plot, but now you'll see a legend on the side. Genome count is doing an additional calculation under the hood. So rather, if we have points that are close together that are overlapping, Geom count says, well, I'm going to represent those as one point, and I'm going to make it a little larger to indicate that there are multiple values here. So under the hood, Geom count is doing some binning. So think of like a histogram. It's dividing our panels up into grid and drawing points to indicate how many values we have in each of those grid squares. I'm not quite sure why this is supposed to be a super effective way of dealing with overplotting, because you're dealing with overplotting by creating large points that tend to overlap. <laughs> but that's sort of the intention. Um, there should be a... Geon count. No. If there were like a bin width option here, remember how with a histogram you can change the size of the bins that the data are being divided into. If there were an option like that in here, then this might make sense because we could do like do one every single, like every individual degree or something like that. And that might be coarse enough where we could actually do something interesting. But it doesn't seem like it in this case. So I don't think geon count going to be a useful way to deal with overplotting here. So the next option is to do the mathematical equivalent of a two-dimensional histogram. So what we've done is what I was just saying, where we divided the x and the y axis into bins, and we are counting the number of points that occur in these bins. The color indicates how many points we have, right? This is starting to be a little more useful. It's, it's hard to see on the screen on a projector, but if you look on your screen, you can probably see, for example, with Lake Tahoe, there's relatively little up here in kind of this blob, this, this upper left blob, and we have more points sort of running along in this association. So this starts to be a little more useful. And in here, we can set options like the bin width, for example, um, to create much smaller values. Although because of the way the data are represented, if you make the bin width much smaller, um, you get kind of weird artifacts that looks more like separated points. Um, this representation you might think is kind of ugly because it looks like 8-bit graphics or something like that with the big squares. Um, you also might have concerns about the color. So um, sticking with Geombin 2D for the moment, let's change the color scale. Rather than Brewer, here I'm going to introduce you to the Viridis color scales. So scale, color, and then Viridis, V-I-R-I-D-I-S, instead of Brewer. There are continuous and discrete versions. We have continuous values because they're counts. Um, 
So we're gonna use scale color beer to C. And also in here, there's an option argument that you can, um, so this uses the beard as package. The beard as package includes, I think, five different color scales. These are designed to show differences in terms of luminance. So low values will be dark, high values will be light. Um, to have an evenly graded change in hue, so you don't get like weird, um, what are called bends, for example, you might be familiar with um, in criticisms of a rainbow scale. Um, and also they're all color line safe. Um, and show up nicely in grayscale. So um, these are sort of really popular color scales right now among data science folks. This thing I think will actually give us, yeah, that's not gonna change anything. Because ggplot has two different ways of representing color. Here it is. C equals A. So along with scale color viridis, I've done scale fill viridis. This bin 2D geom represents values by changing the color of the rectangles or the fill of those polygons. So we need to tell it how to map fill values to colors. So we use scale fill instead. And I think um, this mirror to scale option A is a little easier to read than the, the blues that were ggplot's default. But maybe you really don't like 8 bit graphics. It's kind of blocky. What else have we got? Another geom we can use, not hex, but hex. This is very similar to bin 2D, except instead of dividing it up into little rectangles, it divides it up into uh, little hexagons. Unfortunately, oh, by default, this actually uses much smaller bins than bin 2D. So you get something that looks much smoother, not as blocky. However, also by default, it has a border around the hexagons, <laughs> which kind of drives me crazy. Um, we can fix that, though, by setting color. Actually, no. We want AS color equals dot dot. Uh, I think this is count. Yes, and it's so, but this changes the border. What is this doing? Remember, geom bin and geom hex under the hood look like a two-dimensional histogram. They're dividing things up and counting. There isn't a variable in our data set that represents like how many points are near this location. So under the hood, ggplot is generating a new variable, in this case called dot, dot, count, dot, dot. It's a special variable that we can use. We effectively add a new variable and map it over using some aesthetic. So in this case, we create a new variable called count that we map to the bill. Um, that's by default. We also want to map it to color to get rid of that border. So that's what this AES call is doing. What do you think of the options so far? Any preferences between the options we've seen so far? I like the color. Yeah, it might work better if your data 
are like a, a little more spread out or something like that. Um, or, you know, maybe if you have like a thousand observations <laughs> rather than 15,000. But at this level of density, yeah, geometry doesn't seem to work well. Other thoughts or preferences or problems? Yeah, it's not uh, Geom X is not working. Okay. Are other people having problems or? Yeah. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Okay. Okay. Um, so in that case, let's move on to some of the other representations that I think won't require additional dependencies. So what is next? Um, what is next is ah, geom density. Okay. <laughs> I particularly like these contour representations, part because I'm a backpacker and I spend a lot of time looking at um, contour maps. Um, but yeah, so is this one working without requiring you to install something else? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, here's another representation that maybe if you're used to reading contours, is an even nicer way of getting at um, what uh, Geom Hex and Geom Bin2D were giving us. Um, because you can see, at least it's very clear to me, that there's a ridge right along here giving us an association between the maximum temperature and temp delta. And we can see that in the other four panels as well. This one's this working? Cool. Okay. Um, but like the contour bots by themselves and men. Um, so, yeah. Can you run that again? Just see the plot? Oh. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, and what is that? Ah, okay. Um, so we're actually, let's change the theme real quick before we move on to the next geom. So down at the bottom, I'm gonna use theme VW. I just want the white background rather than the gray background um, to set the contrast for the next geom. So once you've done that, let's comment out geom density 2D. And this one is going to be, it's a bunch of new stuff happening here. So stat underscore density 2D, open parentheses, contour equals false, geom equals quote raster end quote, AES fill equals dot dot density dot dot, show dot legend equals false. I'm gonna explain what all this does. Oh, come on. Okay, so for all of these, remember I've been saying um, that I'm the hood, ggplot is going and doing some calculations, right? With uh, GeoBin 2D and GeoMX, it was doing the two dimensional histogram calculations. So it's dividing stuff into bins, um, counting. 
With GM density 2D, it's doing a 2D kernel density estimation. So remember, a kernel density estimation produces like a smooth distribution to represent the distribution of data. In this case, it's doing it over two dimensions. The function that ggplot uses to do those calculations under the hood all start with stat. So for example, there's a stat underscore bin. Um, I think this might be stat underscore count or stat underscore count 2D or something like that for the histogram like ones. For the density, it's between the stat density. Stat density 2D. Now the thing is, we can have ggplot do the same calculation, but then use different geoms. So rather than using this geom density 2D, rather than using the kind of elevation contour representation, here, by saying geom equals raster, we're telling ggplot to use a raster geom, which is a way of representing color fields in a relatively computational quickly way. So by passing a different geom into the stack, we tell it to represent things using this color field rather than contours. However, there are a bunch of other things we have to do in order to get that to work, especially with this particular geom because it's a little finicky. Um, we have to tell it explicitly not to draw the contours. We also have to tell it what special variable to map to what feature using an aesthetic. So we have to tell it, take the dense value that you calculate, and we're going to map that to the fill aesthetic for this raster geom. And then the final thing we do here is we turn off the legends that tells us what the colors map to because that is not immediately meaningful to us. It's difficult to interpret the actual value of a density plot numerically. So we go ahead and turn that off. So we're doing the same density calculation as for the contours, but we're using a different geom, a color field, in order to that in this particular case, we need to tell this stat function when it doesn't calculate not to automatically draw the geom, or not to automatically draw the contours, and to map density to fill. And we also want to turn off the legend. Can you explain again why you can choose that is basically there in case you happen to have a variable called density in your data frame. So that's a decision by the ggplot developers that when the stat returns its calculated variable, it's going to represent it in this way. Um, one, I said ggplot is really well documented. The one respect in which it is not particularly well documented is that the names of these special variables don't really show up well <laughs> in the help. Um, if you spend some time on uh, Stack Overflow, or you like Google examples of geom density and put in like names of different geoms, you can see examples and recipes that you can follow to figure out what those variables are. Okay. okay. Yes. On the large, so for density to D it will have certain variables that mm -hmm. use. Yes. Yeah. So for example, uh, stat density 2D returns something called density. Dot, dot, density, dot, dot. Um, if you do stat density, which is what you use for one-dimensional kernel density estimates, that will also be called dot, dot, density, dot, dot. Um, Geon hex, the underlying stat function its special variable is dot dot count dot dot. Um, yeah. Okay. I think this looks a lot better, right? It's nice and smooth, um, not on the projection, but on your screen. You can see there's a trend. The thing I don't like about this is that it puts color where we don't actually have data, right? 
So the last option, which is my favorite, addresses that. This is also going to use stat density 2D. Here, instead of the raster geom, we're going to use a polygon geom. For reasons I do not understand, while we are still going to use the fill aesthetic, the variable we need to pass to it is level dot dot. And we need to keep the contours on. But we will go ahead and set show legend to false. Okay. So it took me a while to figure out like which combination of special variables to use with which thing, but this seems to be the stable recipe for doing this. So now we have nice neat blobs. We don't have color where we don't have data, um, but I think it's also very easy to read. And it looks really cool. <laughs> Is there a way to pass for whatever variable or parameter that mm -hmm. the GPLOW will calculate? Like, do you like a result? Say, if I want to know exactly what value to go to take it out of the plot, you mean? Yeah, the table. In principle, there is. Because this thing, what actually returned is an R object. It is a thing. <laughs> well, I'm going to call it a thing just so we can see the structure of this thing. So, um, ggplot returns this object. There's a lot going on in here. And you can also see so, this includes stuff about how things are getting mapped, um, colors, and how um, all kinds of different parameters. I believe it also includes a representation, yeah. Um, it also includes a representation of the data. But this doesn't seem to have um, that dot dot density or dot dot levels. I'm guessing those are somewhere in here, but I don't know where. <laughs> okay. Um, so if you wanted to take the time, this seems like a good candidate, right? Mm -hmm. This is where the stat, uh, stat density 2D, it, I'm guessing it returns, it has returned this object. And so this object in here might contain um, the output data. But I don't know enough to know how to go in here. And pull it out. Oh, um, so first I just save that output into this variable thing, and then I just use str to look at its structure. <coughs> yeah. So this is um, one respect. So, same thing, mean, um, the difference between plotting as a side effect versus plotting versus plot this first class object. So, so what you plot returned is a regular R object. And we can do things like unpack it and, in principle, go in and like pull out those values, for example. Um, but, like I also said, one of the disadvantages of ggplot is once you go under Neath the level that we're working at, there's an enormous amount of structure here. And so navigating this is a big jump up from actually using ggplot. Lots of structure. <laughs> okay. Um, is there anything else 
we really, really want to talk about here. I have some more examples of things like changing the labels and changing the theme, adding the title. We pretty much already covered that. Um, maybe a quick word about if you can save. So when you use base graphics, if you use base graphics, you know that the way you generate a file is you have to first say, I'm going to be creating a PNG or a PDF or what have you, and then um, set some parameters there with a function call. Then you create your plot, and then you have to close that file you dev off. So it's a relatively low level approach to generating a plot on disk. ggplot has a function ggsave to take care of that for you. Um, you see what we've done here. Um, we'll type this up. Uh, ggsave, actually, let me just show you a slightly different use case. Okay, so ggsave, the first thing it expects is a plot generated by ggplot, so one of those first plot objects. If you don't give it one, by default, it just goes to the last plot that was created. Um, so in the example, I don't explicitly give it a plot, I just immediately give it a path. And it knows to go and save the plot that we just created and save that to disk. Then it gets the path, and I've created a special plot folder in which to put it. It looks at the file extension to try to determine what file format we want to use, whether it's PNG or TIFF or PDF or whatever. And then we can give it a height and width. With PNG, you can give it dots per inch. Um, and so on, the set various parameters will come up if you search the help. So this makes it one line to save a plot to a disk. Yes? Um, yeah, I think you do that. It depends on the format because, like, um, PDF, for example, doesn't have. Um, resolution, but PNG does. Um, so there's a dots per inch um, argument. Uh, there's also, so if you're more used to working in metric, for example, you can um, specify width and height, say in centimeters, and then specify units of centimeters. Scale is useful when, if you play around with these, you will find that when um, plots are saved to the disk, the fonts are often much smaller than they show up on your monitor in your interactive session. Um, changing the scale sort of scales those fonts and everything else up and down. Um, so that can be useful for um, you know changing whether you want larger fonts or smaller fonts while keeping the same basic image size. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just to highlight what's going on here, is that clear? Uh, base zero is a function to concatenate strings. So it's taking one string and putting another one right after it. Paste, which is maybe the more familiar one, puts a space between them. Paste zero doesn't leave a space. So I've created this variable plot dir uh, up at the top of my script that just points to, uh, gives a relevant path to a folder where I want to keep all of my plots. Um, and then whenever I want to save a plot, I use a construct like this with um, concatenating plot dir in front of the actual plot name I want to use. Um, you'll see I do something very similar with data. Um, I also use that for output data as well in my actual scripts. It's a way of keeping things organized.
Okay. Uh, we have about 10 minutes. I don't think there's enough time to go into the other bots. Um, so just to show you a quick preview of what else we've got going on in here. Um, this plot, this uses the same data set. It looks at, um, this was a uh, time series plot of those temperature differences for the different locations. Um, and this also incorporates um, some regression models. One of the ggplot includes something called GNOSU that will automatically draw a regression line for you. That is dangerous for the reasons we were talking about, because that means you have a regression model buried down inside this object. You can't get it out to consider things like, is this actually a good model? You can't do, for example, goodness and evaluations. But that can still be useful for exploratory data analysis, for example. Um, I also show an example of how you can create a model outside. And then, so these blue curves here, it's actually a model I create outside of ggplot. And then I add them in to the plot so that we get comparisons between these different sites in fact. Um, and finally, um, the spatial data stuff. So this uses, I kind of ran out of time, so I don't have a great data set for this. Um, the simple features package is a relatively new way of working with spatial data in R that's designed really nice, for example, with ggplot um, and the other tidyverse tools. Um, if you have ggplot version three or better, you can plot directly, you can plot simple features objects directly. So here, I didn't have time to put together a really great example. So this is just the location of the four weather stations. And I went through um, two libraries, ggmap and ggspatial, that are designed to produce um, base maps to go underneath spatial data. Um, I talk about some limitations. So ggmap seems to be in this weird development state where a lot of its functions are deprecated. Um, and you also have to create a Google account and get an API key and also give them your credit card. Um, so there's a bunch of complications with using ggmap, but it lets you do something like this. So you have a map literally right out of Google Maps, um, and you can place some points on it. You can also do things like, for example, polygon, polygon um, to the you can do those 2D contours with the 2D rasters and so on. Um, the other approach is this package ggspatial, which is OpenStreetMaps data, I think by default, or that's what I use as an example. Um, that you don't have to register, but it's kind of slow. Um, but it also gives you relatively nice looking maps, albeit in this particular version the labels got cut off. And so that's what I have there. I'm down to seven minutes. Um, any final questions? Yeah. What are the I'm sorry, say that again. The device must be known as when I try to use digital. Um, if you're getting, so try dev.off, let me come back here, dev.off resets your graphics device. That would be my guess. <laughs> Still cannot check out device. Still cannot check out device. Um, hmm. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure. I would try starting the first session, and if it keeps happening, um, sounds like some kind of, yeah. I know relatively little about how the graphics devices work and debugging problems with the graphics devices. Yeah? In plot three, so you 
the model, you call it model, and then you, but in the future they will do the projections. Yes. You use projections to actually map it, to actually graph it. Yes. So, just quickly, in the ggplot call, I pass in the data I use for most of my stuff, right? I use this. So, uh, this geom path draws the, the lines, the actual temperature values, and then I create a, um, a regression model in each panel. That's what this geom smooth does using the temperature data. But then I want to use data from this other model to draw the red line. So um, that is a regression model just for Sacramento because I want to compare the other sites to Sacramento. So I, um, I create this data frame called predictions and I give it just to this geom using this data argument. So you can pass in multiple data sets two different geoms into ggplot as well. Yes? Uh -huh. Yeah, for the sake of time, <laughs> I kind of skipped that part. Um, if you look in the notes, so the you know, segment is where we create the line segments. And then after the aesthetic, so we did this part with all of the aesthetics. After that, we use in the notes we use an arrow argument. And then um, I give that an arrow call with these particular parameters. Um, so possibly if you just copy and paste, um, you should be able to get the arrows. Or are you saying you tried that and you got some kind of error or other problem? Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's right here. I don't remember. <laughs> this is a plot I created um, nine months ago now. <laughs> and I don't use arrows very often. Um, I pulled this plot up because I thought it was a, a nice, complicated visualization that would work for this workshop. Okay. I think we're close enough that we can call it a morning. Thank you all. I hope everyone from beginners to more experienced folks got something today. Um, Pamela, do we have like a survey that's going to go out for feedback? Okay. Okay. Um, and I will be around for a few more minutes if you have any individual questions.